Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the next in our series of uh, Travellers in Time, our Saturday afternoon lecture series sponsored by Academy Travel. Uh, my name's Jamie Fraser. I'm the senior creator at the Nicholson Museum. Before I do a few housekeeping matters from the museum, uh, Nick from Academy Travel just has a very quick announcement to make. Nick. Okay. Uh, while I have an archaeology-interested audience uh, in front of me, I'm um, just letting you know that next weekend on Saturday at 2 p.m., uh, Academy Travel will be hosting two lectures, one by Dr. Estelle Laser and the other by Ben Churcher. Uh, Estelle will be talking about her own area of expertise, her recent work uh, and the recent projects that are going on in Pompeii. And Ben will be talking about the archaeology of Jordan uh, from where he's just come back. Um, so that's, uh, it's uh, $10 a head. Uh, to for it, it's at the Independent Theatre, uh, which is attached to an owner in North Sydney, so it's kind of quite easy to get to, and it's from 2 to 5 p.m. So if you are interested, uh, you can get tickets if you go to the uh, Academy Travel website, um, just academytravel.com.au. Um, and yeah, look forward to seeing you there if you're interested. And I'll pass you back to Jamie and Robert. Thanks, Nick. Just to underscore, Estelle Laser and Ben Churcher, I think, are two of the most talented speakers on the circuit today. Um, for those of you who are friends of the Nicholson Museum, you should have received in the post by now the next Muse magazine. If you don't receive that in the next few days and you think you are a friend of the Nicholson Museum, then something is wrong. Either your membership needs to be renewed or we need to update your address. So if you don't get it in the next few days, do let me know and we will work out why and fix that up. If you don't get it in the post and you're not a friend of the Nicholson Museum, well, that's quite clearly because you need to become a friend of the Nicholson Museum. In which case, you need to go into the museum and pick up this little pamphlet, fill it out and become one of the friends. And if you are one of the friends of the Nicholson, in addition to the, the discount at the shop and, all, and a few uh, special events, unveiling of new acquisitions, that sort of thing, you also get uh, invitations to our paid, catered evening lectures that happen once a month. Wednesday the 13th of March is our next paid event um, and this features the director of the Australian Institute of Archaeology in Melbourne, Dr Christopher Davey. Now Melbourne's, the AIA's collection of archaeological stuff from Cyprus and the Middle East approaches that of the Nicholson in its size and its depth. It's this, with the Nicholson, these are the two big Middle Eastern Cypriot collections in the country. And the reason that they're there goes back to two personalities who got on very well until they didn't, very spectacularly, in the 1950s. We're talking Professor James Stewart here, curator of the Nicholson, and his sponsor turned nemesis, Walter Beasley in Melbourne. Chris thinks Beasley's been overlooked and is out to redress the issue. This is going to be an interesting lecture in the Nicholson space. Um, and I say this at the moment, it's quite timely, because we have in our new Connections exhibition on display an astonishing inscribed cuneiform tablet from the Assyrian king Ashurnasirpal, and that is on loan from the Australian Institute of Archaeology. If you want to hear more about it, I will give a very quick 10 minutes what is this and why is it important and why do I like it in the gallery as a quick stand-up tour. So 10 minutes after the lecture here, if you want to, come across to the gallery and I'll talk about that. But really, what you really want to hear about is the blue shores of Sardinia and Corsica. Now, uh, Robert Veal, the director of Academy Travel, was here last year giving uh, a talk on Sardinia, particularly in the Bronze Age. He ran out of time, I have to say, by the end of an hour with just the Bronze Age, and I think we had to prize everyone off their seats to get them out because the next part of the story would have taken him at least another hour slash decade. Hopefully he'll keep to the hour, but we're hearing Sardinia Part 2, Die Harder, today, um, which is quite timely given that Robert is about to lead a tour to Sardinia and Corsica. As an archaeologist, I've always wanted to get there. I'm going to have to live vicariously through his slides. Please welcome Robert Veal. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Firstly, can you hear me through this microphone? It's projecting. I will try to make it as exciting as Die Hard, Die Hard, or whatever it is. Um, um, it's, it, I was flattered to be asked uh, back after um, uh, talking uh, last year. Um, and indeed, it's, it's a delightful... Sardinia and Corsica are delightful 
places to be able to talk about um, because they are, in my view, remarkably overlooked um, as islands of the Mediterranean uh, in the Mediterranean. People know a lot, and there's lots of archaeological work in Cyprus. We've just been hearing about Sicily, very visited, very well known, very well understood, perhaps because of the relatively small uh, population, perhaps just because of the course of history and the fact that the Western Mediterranean um, wasn't as significant, for example, when Spain started to look to the Atlantic and Portugal and move out in that way. Um, um, or perhaps Lord Byron never went there and it wasn't on the grand tour. So, so um, uh, now, without doubt, talking about Sardinia, the um, Bronze Age sites, the more than 6,500 uh, Bronze Age sites, dating from about, or, and even earlier, Neolithic as well, dating from about 3,400 BC, right through to the uh, Roman period, are the standout feature. And if you're interested in archaeology in the past, it's the standout reason for going. There is no other place that I know of that has such an amazing range of sites such a variety of sites and it's one of those wonderful slow burn um, experiences where you see one you think oh that's quite interesting you see a second mm, that's different a third and a fourth and then by the time you get you know you hooked um, I've, I've seen it it's happened to me and I've seen it happen to people like that there it's a very rewarding destination but what really interests me I think about history um, and the Mediterranean it's not just a single layer but it's the accumulation of layers uh, over time seeing uh, how when you have different groups of people in the one specific geographical location over time, how things change, but also how little bits of the past get left behind in so many different ways and how this creates identity. And I think the Mediterranean and the islands of the Mediterranean are particularly interesting because they're always, if they are dominated by you know, a more significant uh, culture, such as, for example, Sardinia and Corsica being Roman colonies, they're at the edges of that colony always and they're always at the crossroads or the intersection of, of, of other colonies so that fascination with the layering I think is particularly rich in these liminal places if you like around the edge and I, but apart from the sunshine and the great views and the nice seafood and things like that um, I think it's part of, uh, of the fascination so today um, you know I very loosely um, called this the post-classical age because having got into trouble with timing last that sort of leaves it open but what I would like to cover is just very briefly at the beginning, just a, a, um, a little bit of a recap of the Bronze Age, but then move in very loose terms to the um, Roman period as well and look at the identity that it created there, but then move on um, through the Vandal, um, Byzantine and medieval periods to see that identity um, building. And hopefully, if I do my job uh, on time today, um, I'll leave you at the end of, of the Middle Ages, the beginning of the modern period, which is characterised by uh, colonisation from, um, from Aragon, which later becomes Spain, and on the island of Corsica um, from, um, uh, from Genoa. Now, I have to admit something. Up until about Tuesday this week, I'd been uh, assiduously preparing and thinking about my lecture on Sardinia in the post-classical age and then I went on to the Nicholson and Academy travel websites and saw that the description I actually submitted was Sardinia and Corsica uh, in there and I thought oh my gosh how am I going to get through that. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about Corsica but I've got to say it will be by way of comparison and, and peripheral rather than the main narrative which will be. So uh, I hope that doesn't disappoint um, anyone so I won't be dealing with Napoleon uh, for example or, or, uh, or Corsica's fascinating move um, towards um, independence. Um, so I think if I just click, that'll give us the next slide. Okay, again, uh, the, I started last talk with this slide, but just uh, I think geography is extremely important uh, and space. So it's the second largest island in the Mediterranean, which makes it even more remarkable that it's really um, so little known, even, even to the Italians um, themselves. 2,000 kilometres of coastline, of, one, of which one little bit, bit from, uh, if you look at the top right, from Maddalena down to Tavolara, that area is the famous Costa Smeralda, which if you ask most Italians what they know about Sardinia, they'll know about jet setters flying in there and having a beautiful life uh, for a couple of weeks of a year and, and flying out. Um, Mr. Berlusconi held his bunga bunga parties uh, at his villa on the Maddalena Islands, um, for example, uh, to the north. Sardinians, of course, know more of their story, but um, it, it, it remains there. The population uh, is 1.6. 
uh, five million, of which a third of those live around Cagliari, the one in, down here in the south, the one solid urban centre with an ancient past, uh, the number of sheep, uh, four million. So, so uh, sheep are going to come back again. A number of uh, living languages which are a little... Uh, um, these traces of, of, of that history. Uh, and like um, Sicily to the south and the Val d'Aosta, it's an autonomous region of Italy. It entered uh, after World War II, um, the Republic of Italy, on that basis, uh, maintaining uh, its um, independence. Uh, again, there won't be a test on this uh, later. The blue ones are the ones <laughs> that you have to remember. But again, if you've travelled to Mediterranean islands, to Cyprus, to Sicily, to other places, you'll know uh, that they're contested uh, politically. Uh, and um, in fact, huge numbers of groups maybe. And, that, and that's exactly what makes them interesting. Much speculation, of course, about the origins of the Neolithic and uh, Neuragic cultures, as, as, as they are known. Um, early uh, archaeologists and historians in the 19th century believing, for example, that the Neuragic civilization must have come from Greece because you know, only the Greeks were that sophisticated and things like that. More recent theories, and including those promoted by Sardinian archaeologists, suggests that it's an indigenous uh, culture. Um, their position being a large island and a fairly central location in the Mediterranean means uh, they're attractive to other groups. The Carthaginians, and then largely in response to the Carthaginian threat, the Romans, uh, with the collapse of the Roman world, uh, we see um, um, Vandals and then Byzantines. Uh, we see with the growth uh, of the Arab world and uh, the Caliphate uh, in North Africa, um, centuries of um, threat uh, to, to, the, um, to the islands uh, from, from various Arab and North African groups. Um, along with many other places in Italy, but in a completely different way, uh, we have a period of relative independence, uh, the so-called Judicati, which are named after the Giudici, which were the heads of state in the Middle Ages. And this is, again, a very interesting characteristic and something I want to um, spend a little bit of, of time on. They are comparable in some ways to the independent city-states which emerged in central Italy uh, in the power vacuum uh, of the Dark Ages. They are similar in some ways um, to uh, the Republic of Venice and its doge, which comes out of um, the decline of the Byzantine world. Um, as we move uh, through to the last 1,000 years, from 1,000 onwards, we find um, Italian trading um, states or maritime empires, Pisa and then Geno Genoa, um, battling uh, for control. Genoa eventually, of course, settles and conquers uh, the island of Corsica, I won't be, but there's a period then of 500 years of effective colonial uh, government. And I have to say, um, I didn't understand, having taught and, and taken people to Venice for years and years and talked extensively about the Venetian Maritime Republic, I didn't really understand the significance of the Genoese Republic until I travelled around Corsica and saw the incredible infrastructure, the bastions, the roads, the bridges and things like that, and understood that this was Genoa's backyard. And, and I, I, that's when I finally understood the, you know, the importance of the Genoese uh, trading empire, which went right up through the Black Sea. Um, from the 15th century onwards, of course, uh, uh, the Spanish become more dominant in European and international um, affairs. Uh, and as far as Sardinia is concerned, we have Aragon, the crown of Aragon, which I'll talk a little bit about, which later becomes the Spanish uh, kingdom and then the empire. Um, and uh, as far as, again, uh, Sardinia is concerned, um, um, it's a Savoy possession in the 18th century. I'm not going to get into the um, uh, intricacies of that. It's far too complicated and it will take me a month, as Jamie said, to, to get there. Um, not passing, of course, or passing to Italy uh, along with the other Savoy territories in 1861. Corsica, a, a similarly tumultuous time uh, in the 18th century. Uh, there's an independence movement there uh, that is thwarted. Uh, largely, well, in, not, well, in, in great part because of Napoleon, um, uh, uh, and, um, and eventually, of course, uh, well, in the Napoleonic period, of course, it bec becomes part of France and remains part of France. So they don't take on their sort of modern political identity until very, very late in the history. So today I'll, I'll start very lightly with Carthaginia and, and hopefully get us up to that, that um, Pisan period just um, towards the end. 
going. So just um, again, if you weren't at the last uh, talk um, and or you know you haven't been there or aware of it, just um, a couple of images to show you um, th these remarkable um, structures. Um, the neuragic structure. So a neurage is just the term for a tower. And the whole civilization has taken on that name. The archaeologists have given it that name, even though, of course, there's much greater complexity than uh, the, the, these uh, towers. We have, um, you know, for example, this particular one at Santuantin is at the center of a valley, and it would appear that one from the archaeological record, we don't have a written record, that, um, that you know, there was one dominant family or clan that controlled the whole valley. You can see that in the structures of the buildings. Other neuragic um, towers are just single isolated places in the countryside. Um, we have an absolute wealth of material from the bronzes and the pottery, an absolutely um, extraordinary uh, legacy. I'll show you some of that uh, in a second. We also have very clear evidence of sophisticated um, religious practice, which was to do with the veneration of warriors, but also of water and uh, these magnificent um, um, uh, uh, hippogeum um, structures or underground um, structures for, for, for water and things like that. Not surprising on an island where there is very little water uh, that it takes on a religious significance. So that's perhaps one of the most um, spectacular ones. Um, archaeologists, of course, have argued about from the evidence about the nature uh, of these structures. Um, interestingly, and I'll talk about um, the reputation that Sardinia gets from others. When Sardinian archaeology really got underway in the 20th century, uh, one school of thought really pushed the idea that these were very communal, democratic kinds uh, of organisation, whereas other structures like this um, suggest a dominant clan and a kind of a hierarchical political structure. Um, but more of that um, a bit later. The, we don't know, and people are want in history and archaeology, of course, to make the past fit the, uh, the view the way that they would like to see um, uh, things. So again, uh, just another, this is an aerial shot of the same structure. Uh, just note the, this one shows you a bit more clearly the complex archaeology. This is done entirely without machinery. Um, the stones are, are cut and, and brought long distances. Huge number of spaces, this particular structure. has got more than 20 rooms, internal staircases, watchtowers. Um, things that look like meeting houses and, and places with other um, functions um, all around um, the outside. Uh, again, this is just showing you uh, the corbling, which is the um, ability to create uh, these very large roof areas. I mean, these are solid. These have got meters and meters of soil above them, um, those ones on the right, all done uh, with a dry stone uh, technique and cutting the stone there just uh, you know again they're just um, remarkable sites six and a half thousand of these sites around the island have been identified it's um, uh, it's amazing um other artifacts are um these such as these giants which appears to have been part of a hero's um uh, a, a shrine or a worshipping area for military uh heroes this is an example of uh of carving and things like that which early 19th century archaeologists was thought of such quality that it couldn't possibly have been undertaken by Sardinians. It must have been um, somebody from the uh, Minoan world uh, or, you know, who'd, who'd come over um, at that time uh, to leave them. And uh, just one example there uh, of the wonderful bronze um, carving. I, I'd mentioned warriors uh, before. Uh, here's um, a good example thought to be a village chief um, with the staff and the various insignia there, but we've got the wonderful bronzes, the bronzetti, as they're called in, in Italian, pottery, stone sculptures, decorative objects, jewellery, uh, mainly found in there, and a huge amount of data um, that, that's there. So we've got this very rich civilization that is there for a long time, is quite probably indigenous, uh, that people then look back to and characterise in all sorts of different ways because of the lack of the historical record. So, so this becomes the base culture on which different views of Sardinian um, identity are, are, are put on um, in, in, the, in the sort of the superstructure of history. Um, if you like, there's another, some of those bronzes. These are all in the Cagliari um, Museum. Okay. But the period that I want to talk about is, is, is after 
uh, then. And again, just um, some dates to cover some of those periods. So we have Phoenician and then after the, the conquest um, by the Persians, Punic, uh, Carthaginian uh, settlements, mainly on the south and the west coast, coast logical because that's the coast that faces Africa. Uh, the interest then of Rome uh, in, uh, in, in the um, Punic Wars in defeating the Carthaginians leads to, and in fact there are some significant battles uh, that take place there. Um, the Romans are there and the Roman writing that we have suggests quite strongly that the, um, that the Sardinians didn't um, fall into the Roman world um, easily um, in, 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 uh, in that way. Uh, a period of you know, some confusion then in, in the, with the um, falling apart of the Roman world, uh, the Vandal occupation, Vandals who'd come from somewhere up near Scandinavia, down through Germany, across down to Spain, and then across to the islands. Uh, rule, and they were also threatening, of course, North Africa uh, at that particular moment. That then is reversed um, and reverted in the 6th century with the Byzantine reconquest. Um, I'm sure many of you know of the work of Belisarius in Italy and in Sicily, but he also got across to North Africa uh, as well uh, and, and then up to um, um, Sardinia. So that we then have um, a remarkable period of Byzantine influence. And again, one tends to think of the Byzantine world, naturally enough, centering on Constantinople and extending perhaps as far as, as Venice. But the exarchate of North Africa, of which um, Carthage was the capital, uh, existed for um, several hundred years. Records are very, very um, um, sparse on this area. We don't know, for example, who was the rule of the exarch, the administrator for many periods uh, in, in, in this time. Uh, the tide then turns uh, once more uh, towards uh, uh, the Arabs and, and, their, and their various attempts. Um, uh, and we have some of the original uh, uh, chronicles written uh, usually in the 9th, 10th and 11th centuries uh, in Arabic telling us uh, about um, the island. So it's nice to get sources that are not, uh, not just simply from the West. Uh, we see the abandonment of the classical world from the early 8th century onwards. Uh, so, so nowadays when you travel to Sardinia, the archaeological sites are typically on the coast and they're 10, 15 kilometres uh, from what are the modern, or since medieval times, the, the, the principal cities uh, which moved inland um, simply because the threat from, um, uh, from pirates uh, from North Africa was, was too great. So, so again, it's in the Middle Ages uh, that um, one f sees the beginnings of the modern civilization and, and the modern town. So nearly always uh, you'll get this pair in Cagliari. Uh, the capital is probably, I won't say the only, but it's, it's a significant exception to that where the modern city is still sitting on the ancient, um, on the ancient site. But that's probably because it's such a, um, a good site <laughs> up on a hill overlooking a very large um, harbour. So just very, very quickly, and I'm not, I'm not going to dwell on this at all. Um, so um, again, something that's important for our, the sort of the layering that I'm trying to build up here is the understanding that this ancient civilization persists, okay, through both the Carthaginian and importantly through the Roman um, times as well. Uh, so uh, in this Italian map, as you can see, uh, this is showing um, a number of the sites um, uh, on, on the coast, most of which are significant uh, cities uh, to this day, um, which are later Romanized, uh, but are important, of course, um, Carthaginian trading um, posts originally. So that basically, um, you know, the, the Carthaginians, their interest in Sardinia is very much as part of a maritime em empire, ports for the moving of goods um, throughout the Mediterranean. Um, um, some of them, such as Taros, you can see there on the uh, west coast, and Nora on the south coast, uh, are significant archaeological sites today. They're Romanized later on, um, but there's clear evidence uh, of um, the pre-existing Carthaginian settlement. If you go to places such as the island of Sant'Antiocho, you've got, and also up at Taros, you've got features, distinctly Carthaginian features, such as the Tophet, the, the child burial area. I won't get into <laughs> um, Carthaginian child burial or we'll never get out of it um, uh, at this point. So those places later get Romanized and it's not till the Middle Ages uh, that many of those places, at the same time, uh, the Neuragic 
uh, culture is existing. And again, if you travel through Sardinia, uh, and um, especially to that area in the center there, it's an area of mountains, very few roads inaccessible. It's not surprising given the Carthaginians' largely financial interest that there's no, that, 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 that civilization persists. The Romans, of course, are much more systematic and much more total in their, in their conquests, um, but even they do not uh, ever conquer um, some of that inland uh, area. Um, and so, again, if you go to the archaeological museums in, in Sardinia, you're going to get some excellent uh, um, Carthaginian um, finds that are there in there. So that's uh, the site of Taros, uh, for example. Uh, now, that's the show. It's basically the Roman overlay, but there's um, still a Carthaginian um, cemetery uh, there. There's also always, they've found, archaeologists have found always then evidence of neuragic cultures uh, behind. And then right at the top in that particular one, uh, that's from the Spanish period. That's a watchtower from the, um, from the Spanish period. So it's got um, all of those layers there. Okay. Um, but where I want to sort of rest a little more um, is uh, once we start to get um, to the Roman uh, period, because this is, of course, where we start to get substantial written records um, about the Sardinians and uh, the Corsicans. Um, so the histories that you read and the various sources that you read, especially in the third and the second centuries BC, characterise the relationships with Rome of one of almost constant uh, uh, warfare. And one of the things for which the Romans do not appear to forgive uh, the Sardinians, and this is important in, in, in the view that we get of them, was that they had formed workable relationships with the Carthaginians. Uh, and indeed, Roman writers argue that the, sort of the Sardinian culture that they find is a blending together of the, that earlier neuragic uh, with the Carthaginian. Um, the Punic Wars, of course, um, create a crisis uh, for Rome in this part of the Mediterranean uh, and uh, Sardinia is not uh, exempted from that. We have, through the Roman uh, um, chronicles, various accounts of rebellions, including one that gets the status of a war uh, in, in, in the, in the, at the time of the Second uh, Punic uh, War. Um, we then have accounts, you know, we have some accounts, these things, of course, are always uh, need to be taken with some latitude, uh, but some uh, evidence of, you know, the scale, the large scale of some of the battles. And we also have the record uh, of um, triumphs that are given to various Roman uh, military leaders at the time that tell us something about the activity as well. Um, we do know um, that whilst the coast dwellers are subdued, um, uh, the highlanders remain, uh, the Civitate is bar barbarie. And again, this is in no way historic, <laughs> um, but sort of based on descriptions of the way, you know, that um, these tough um, mountain dwelling Sardinians um, might have appeared. This is a, sort of very loosely based um, on, on some of the descriptions of, 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 uh, of, of the way. So here's um, a couple of sources. This one from the, uh, from the um, beginning of the um, second century. Under the command and auspices of the consul Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, the legion and the army of the Roman people subjugated Sardinia. More than 80,000 enemies were killed or captured in the province, <laughs> conducting things in the happiest way for the Roman state, um, freeing the friends, restoring the income. Um, he brought back the army safe and sound and rich in booty for the second time he entered Rome in triumph. In memory of these events, he dedicated this panel to Jupiter. So um, these are the kinds of fragments uh, through which we, we read some nice archaeological evidence. If you go to Ostia, the square of the corporations, the trading square there, uh, we have at the entrance to the various um, shops uh, uh, um, around there, we have one that's, uh, you know, the, the, the sailors um, from, uh, the, or the merchants from Cagliari. Uh, Caralis, uh, as it was. So again, uh, you know, clear evidence that they're a significant um, and distinct part uh, of the um, uh, Roman world. So looking now at the, then at the, um, uh, the Roman uh, settlements, and you can see they're more or less the same as uh, the, um, the Carthaginian ones that I showed before. Um, the region then uh, out of control, if you like, or not under uh, firm Roman rule, uh, Barbaria, today uh, referred to as Barbaja. 
So, so the, the contemporary Sardinian term for it is there. Um, of all of the sites that I'm, I could have shown you, um, the one site I, just, I do want to show you is a lovely little one called Fordonjanus because it's Roman but distinctly um, uh, Sardinian uh, at, 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 at the same time. Um, please, uh, linguists, apologize. I apologize for, for my mix of Greek and Latin. Oh, it's a Roman Asclepium. Uh, that is a, a temple or a place of healing. It's a castrum, so at the front there you've got uh, what's left of the, of, the, of the temple and then behind you've got the small military uh, encampment. It's located on thermal springs that are still used uh, today uh, and it's on a road that links the Roman coast to the interior. In other words, it was a military road used specifically for the purposes of controlling or limiting the movement of those groups uh, of the barbarians uh, up in the hills. So in tact, indeed, some of the most, if I just go back a slide, some of the most interesting Roman archaeological sites, in my view, are the ones that can be, that are on that edge there, that are, that are, that are, that are linking there, because they, 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 you know, they're trading routes, but it's, um, they're, they're very distinctive, and whereas you know, in a place like Nora, you'll find many of the features that you'll find in Roman towns all over the empire. You get some slightly different uh, sites here. So this particular one, uh, for example, you can see there the two pools there um, used for sort of ritual hearing, and particularly the one that's on the left uh, there has a set of steps going right into it and down it. Ignore this. <laughs> this has actually been removed. I was there last year. It's been removed um, since then. This is part of the modern thermal, or well, this is the very early attempt at the modern thermal spa. Okay. So there is a putting an Asclepium on there. Well, you've got hot water. You've got geothermal uh, water there. And uh, in among the ruins right through to the modern age, was the spa has moved across the river um, uh, to, to this day. So it's, it's a fascinating and very distinctive um, site uh, that's there. Um, there, if, 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 if fought on Janus. Um, so through these bruising military uh, encounters uh, and through the persistence of the neuragic civilization up on the hill, a, a, a picture of um, Sardinians uh, begins to uh, emerge. Um, 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 you know, so, so you know, regarded by the Romans as being backwards and unhealthy. And I think that's a view uh, with some Italians that's persisted real persi real persisted right through the mid-20th century. Uh, we have this description, for example, of, of Strabo, of, the, of, of Sardinian slaves. Whoever bought one, aggravating their purchases by their apathy and insensibility, regrets the waste of money. <laughs> regrets the waste of money. Um, <laughs> Cicero describes them as thieves with rough wool cloaks. And here's the interesting one. And that from the Punics mixed with African blood, originated the African and Sardua as interchangeable to prove their supposed cunning and hideous nature inherited by the former Carthaginian masters. Um, there. Um, a term, uh, Sardi Venales, um, known um, for something of like, the way that we might have used uh, in post-World War II Australia for Japanese and then early on 40 years ago for Chinese uh, goods. Yet e economically, of course, and also militarily, Sardinia is playing an important role. Uh, as a grain supply, particularly before Egypt uh, is conquered, uh, for metal producing and also for its excellent sailors uh, who are um, staffing the Roman um, fleet. Um, so the tough Sardinian is born um, through Roman writers. The tough Sardinian continues right through to the 20th century. So I'm jumping sort of right through. This was uh, an award-winning film which showed in the Venice um, film Biennale, uh, sorry, the Venice Film Festival in 1960, didn't win the, the Golden Lion, but won a prize. Um, the Bandits from Orgosolo. Now, Orgosolo is a rather forsaken town right in the middle of that Barbadja uh, region, famous today for its political um, murals, which decorate the walls and things like that on, on political themes. I, uh, I did a, a, a pilgrimage to travel up there to see, see what it's like. But again, uh, this was also the time when spaghetti westerns, by the way, were being filmed in small Sardinian towns and you can go to many uh you know where you can go to the place where a fistful of dollars was um, um filmed for example so i'll just read you i got from the um <laughs> from some publicity about the film just a description of this it's rather romanticized but this ancient idea about what sardinians are like is persist this is this is the plot summary michele a shepherd of orgosolo unfairly charged with rustling and murder sheep have to come into it um is forced to take to the hills in his flight in, into the inaccessible areas of Barbadja, where there is neither water nor pastures, he loses every sheep in his flock. One night, desperate because he is full of debts 
and with impending trials, he goes into the sheepfold of another shepherd and at gunpoint steals every sheep. Michele has become a bandit. And there he is uh, on the left in that, in that particular movie. So, um, yeah, so, so tough, uncompromising um, uh, people there. Just, uh, I said we'd make peripheries into the, uh, into the Corsican world, uh, just to let you, show you that the Romans were not any kinder uh, uh, to the Corsicans. Um, the, here is Seneca, who was banished there for eight, I suspect, rather long years. Their first law is to revenge themselves, <laughs> their second to live by plunder, their third to lie, and their fourth to deny the gods. <laughs> That's there. Okay. So, with the falling apart then of the, of, of the uh, Roman world, um, uh, there, as I mentioned, it's particularly uh, the Vandals moving through, firstly through to Carthage, uh, and then up to both Sardinia and Corsica, the Balearic Islands, Sicily, and other places, uh, who first bring about um, the collapse of that um, Roman world. But for what we see on the island today, it's the Byzantine uh, reconquest uh, that's um, um, significant. Uh, and again, we have um, a, a complicated political um, scene in which um, a vandal leader uh, in Sardinia rebels against the Carthaginians. Reinforcements from Carthage arrive, and so they're fighting that fight. The Sardinians are rising. But in the meantime, Belisarius attacks Carthage itself, and they have to withdraw. Um, so from that point, um, um, Sardinia uh, is, um, is freed of the Vandal threat and comes under the rule of um, the Byzantines, who have reconquered, uh, but of course, as we know, don't manage to hold uh, that area. So um, little known. Um, people know, of course, of course, about the Byzantine Empire uh, in the east uh, and particularly uh, what's going on in the Adriatic and, and Venice and things like that. The Exarchate of Africa is, is uh, less well studied. It is eventually, of course, swamped uh, by the Arab Caliphate um, as that grows. But, but it's that, um, that movement of people uh, and of forces which shapes um, Sardinia and Corsica's um, history uh, at that particular point. So, um, travelling uh, around the island and usually immediately adjacent uh, to the Roman and Carthaginian sites, one sees evidence of Byzantine uh, structures and, and the Byzantine world. And indeed, the later medieval administration of the island and, and the way the system is thought to have come from the Byzantines. So much, much as the structure of the Venetian Republic and, and the Doge and all those figures is thought to be uh, or is argued by most historians to be largely Byzantine, so too medieval um, Sardinia and to a lesser extent medieval Corsica are shaped um, by this period of Byzantine influence. It's often very, very hard to see there, um, you know, in terms of actual physical remnants, um, but it exists perhaps a bit more uh, in the social structures and the, 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 um, the patterns of urbanisation. Um, um, so once, uh, of course, once Carthage falls in the 8th century, it falls uh, uh, to the caliphate, uh, then rather hopelessly, it's, um, Sardinia is still part of Byzantium and is ruled over by Ravenna. Of course, there's no way from Ravenna that uh, the Byzantines can get fleets, can protect the island in any way. So it's not surprising that from this very time we start to see evidence of um, Sardinia and Corsica rising up as independently uh, administered. Um, so again, just little Byzantine churches, nothing magnificent architecturally um, uh, around there. The, the slide at the bottom I just thought I'd show you because right behind the 7th century church there's a new Rajik tower. Uh, popping out probably from about 1800 BC. So again, nothing changes, does it, <laughs> in, in, in those ways. Um, probably the best site, and I have to admit that I haven't been there, but the, sort of the most interesting site is the patron saint of Cagliari, uh, San Saturnino. He is persecuted by, at the time of Diocletian, in the early 4th uh, century. We know there's a church there from the 6th century. Uh, the actual rebuilding that you see today is from the 11th uh, century, but having a look at the floor plan, the Greek cross floor plan and many of the fragments, uh, it's clearly got a lot of the Byzantine uh, original uh, in there. So small physical traces, but perhaps larger social uh, and political traces um, for the Byzantine world. 
Moving through now to the um, Arab uh, period, uh, just again, just a map uh, to show you the, where the fault lines were uh, between the growing uh, caliphate and uh, the shrinking uh, Byzantine world. Um, one sees, of course, and if you travel to Sicily, you'll um, know ab about the contestation, the remnants uh, of that there. Sardinia, nominally at this stage, so once Carthage has fallen, this is the period where it's supposedly under the influence of Ravenna, um, but effectively uh, not much can be done. Uh, and, and indeed, uh, there are accounts uh, of incursions uh, throughout that time. It would appear that the first uh, um, invasions from the Caliphate came not from North Africa, but uh, from, um, from Spain, uh, across from Spain. So the Moors who'd moved across, the Berbers from North Africa. Uh, we think Cagliari was abandoned at this time, this prize uh, site. Things get really bad um, in 827 when the um, Muslims conquer Sicily finally, and that really means that the Straits of Messina and all the seas to the south are no longer safe uh, for the Byzantine uh, floods. Interestingly, um, we find, and this is where we see perhaps persistent of, persistence of this idea of the Sardinian being the, the, tough, the tough soldier, there's a letter from um, 851, and this is the first reference where the Pope asks uh, for the Iudex Provinciae, so the, the king of the province or the, the judge of the province, quite literally the ruler of the province, uh, for assistance um, against attacks from Spain. So Rome itself is being threatened. Sardinians are known as good soldiers. And so here's the Pope writing to someone in Sardinia, not to someone in Constantinople, saying, we need your help. So it's the first bit of evidence that we have. And it's quite early on as of self-rule. Uh, and of course, it's an indication of the collapse of Byzantine influence and the threat uh, from the world. So there's a map, uh, um, a, a Spanish Arab map um, of Sardinia from slightly later on. Okay. Um, interestingly, and just um, a week ago, I found uh, a, a very good uh, site, a, a blogger by the name of Maxentius, um, who had uh, translated uh, a lot of the Arab sources about Sardinia at the time, which was very um, interesting and uh, I hadn't come across before. And one of the things it did for me is to reinforce this reputation of the Sardinian identity, which I think is, was, was created firstly by the Roman writers. Um, uh, the first one is uh, interesting. The Arabs who invaded, who invaded from Africa massacred the Sardinians, but they in turn were also massacred um, by the Sardinians. You think about history and history writing at that time, how reluctant a writer who might have been wanting to please, you know, to tell the narrative of glory would say that, uh, in fact, no, we were massacred in equal numbers by the Sardinians. Uh, Ali Drisi, the famous geographer who was in the Norman court of Palermo in the 12th century, writes this, the Sardinians are different from any other nation of the rum, that is, any other Romans. They are, uh, they are brave men, I that should say, who never abandon their weapons. We know uh, that the Byzantine Emperor, uh, in the Byzantine Emperor Constant VII's Book of Ceremonies, refers to a regiment of imp uh, Sardinian Imperial Guards. He had Viking Imperial Guards as well. We know that, the Varangian Guard. Um, Sardinians as well, going, their reputation is such that they're in, in, in Constantinople. And that letter that I mentioned before mentions uh, or le leads to the presence of a Sardinian papal guard, a bit like the Swiss guards uh, were in the Renaissance uh, in Rome, and the, and the establishment of a, a Sardinian town, Sardinian village um, near um, the city uh, in, in there. Um, another interesting tantalizing piece of evidence um, comes from sort of the area of religion uh, at this particular time of what's happening in this part of the um, Mediterranean. And this is St. Augustine, uh, the great church father, St. Augustine of Tipo. Hippo, he is buried at Pavia, south of Milan. This was the Lombard capital uh, at the time, uh, but his relics are translated, which is the term to say they were moved by the will of God, um, um, to, uh, from Africa to Cagliari uh, by the Byzantine Bishop of Hippo, obviously as a threat. And then the Lombard king, who had recently uh, converted to Roman Catholic Christianity from, from a heretical form of that, organises the purchase 
uh, of the remains of Hippo uh, from the merchants of Cal or from the city of Cagliari, and it's taken up to its current resting place and lies in this magnificent um, Gothic um, arco um, tomb uh, at this uh, at this particular one. This church, so famous in the Middle Ages, it's actually uh, described by Dante. Uh, San Pietro in Cel d'Oro. It's called St. Peter's of the Golden Sky, which is a reference to the gold mosaics. Um, so noteworthy that uh, um, um, he was there. So from this chaos and, and from the collapse of what had been before emerges um, Sardinia and Corsica in their medieval uh, forms. And this is the period which was referred to by the name of the judges, the Judicati. Uh, I mentioned the letter of the, um, from 751 mentions a Udex. We know from correspondence, again, papal correspondence in the 11th century, uh, that the island is divided into four uh, of those uh, areas. And that would appear that they had come from the Byzantine structure. The actual position of the Udex, uh, the judge uh, himself, is a very interesting one and does appear to have come from Byzantine structures. So, so the judge, it's partly hereditary, but also elected. Okay, so, so the judgeship could be passed down and there were rules of um, inheritance, but equally the council of elders or other assemblies could remove the eudex if he wasn't, or the judge if he or she uh, wasn't um, performing properly. So it's, it's a combination of a sort of a, a representative uh, form of government, a republican uh, form of government and absolute rule. And in that way, it resembles very closely uh, a figure like the Doge uh, of Venice, who is at once above the fray, but second subject to, uh, to the election uh, of, of um, the... So sovereignty is actually held uh, by the Council of Elders, the Corona di Logu, um, whereas he is, is the figurehead of it. So unlike a king, he doesn't actually possess, uh, possess uh, the land. We find various, you know, the, you know, the heraldry um, associated with the city-states. And again, that's interesting because it's in most cases in, uh, you know, the medieval iconography, of course, is about the family rather than the place. So, so um, again, rather like the winged line of Venice or something like that, we have a logo that's um, standing for them. So the actual um, division, uh, there we know there are uh, descriptions that exist, protocols uh, for the way that the various states were given. And again, this display of the social order through procession and ceremony is quite Byzantine. Uh, in its nature. I don't mean complicated, I'm, I'm, I mean it mirrors very much the far more elaborate um, um, things that were going on in Constantinople. So we know a lot about the coronation ceremony, the representatives of the local districts, the curidorias, members of the high clergy, the castle lords uh, and representatives um, from each of the cities uh, in the area. Interestingly, and this, hopefully I'll finish the talk with one particular person, if there was no direct male descendant, uh, a female was selected. And there are also um, uh, uh, examples of, of regency. Um, the chancellery was administered by uh, the state and uh, headed by a bishop. Uh, there were local areas with the local mayor. We know something uh, as well about the structure of the army uh, in those structures, in, in those areas. Um, I'm going to skip through that. Um, just to give you a, co a quick contrast, a quick diversion um, up to Corsica, uh, we have slightly different... Um, period. So Corsica is more subject to what's happening in mainland uh, Italy. But at about the same time, or about 1000 uh, AD, um, there's a move towards uh, independence. And Corsica splits into two areas. Uh, in the north, uh, referred to in Corsican history as the Terra del Comune, you have a form of communal republican government, which is not unlike what was going on in Tuscany. Uh, to the south, a completely um, different um, um, structure and so, sorry, I'm just uh, just uh, flicking through. So now, if you travel overland through Corsica, you'll understand why immediately through the middle of Corsica there are mountains which are formed at the same time, the same geological action that forms the European Alps. <laughs> You've crossed the European Alps, you know it's spectacular. They are, imagine that right in the middle of Corsica. Um, so the southern side of the island is very high 
difficult to cross uh, mountain ranges with these deep valleys which lead down to the sea uh, in them very very hard to control and to move through the north is a much gentler plain um, going out with a number of seaports off to the north so it's not surprising that the communal government existed down to the mountain range where things there whereas each of these valleys which run sort of across in this direction the, the mountain ranges run this way um, like the Alps each of the valleys is ruled by a particular feudal family um, who hate one another <laughs> nearly as much as they hate the people from over the hills um, who are you know trying this sort of you know suspiciously left-leaning communal um, um, go uh, government in there so so we have this division and this persistence uh, of it now again in modern Corsica uh, of course you have uh, it's a reputation for mafia-like um, organisation of commerce and government and things like that for being, you know, compared, you know, not following the Napoleonic Code in the way that other um, French territories do. Um, a lot of that then is ascribed back, and particularly in the south, uh, to that uh, period when um, northern Corsica, um, you know, is trying uh, communal government and is, you know, holding hands with the, uh, with Pisa. Um, um, southern Corsica and the barons of southern Corsica almost naturally turn towards Genoa, <laughs> you know, the great enemy of Pisa. So, so these, you know, my enemy's enemy is my friend. So, so uh, fractious politics um, in a word uh, in that um, particular area. So turning now, and uh, this is the sort of the last of the um, periods um, that I want to um, cover uh, in any uh, sort of detail um, is um, the growth of Pisa and again this is uh, a whole course unto itself the Italian maritime empires but Pisa first and then Genoa in this part of the Mediterranean uh, create enormous maritime empires uh, this is just a map it's just uh, think about the technology the sailing and the navigation technology uh, of the day and you under begin to understand what amazing accomplishments these were uh, at this period to be able to do it so so towards the Levant of course and up through to Constantinople these were important um, sea routes in comp competition was coming from North Africa so Pisa very much had to uh, you know defend themselves um, against for, for trade reasons um, a, a, against that um, but you know and, and, and also the coast so, so um, important it brought great wealth of course and great prestige uh, to the Pisans and so one of the areas so the area in red uh, on this particular map is showing you by about the 13th century the territories of um, Sardinia which were controlled uh, by the Pisans now as trade and commerce picked up around the Mediterranean in the Middle Ages in the later Middle Ages the 11th 12th and 13th centuries other places became more interested in Corsica and Sardinia. And so rather than sort of these sort of rather local fights, um, they be, tended to become pawns in greater battles. And, and through much of the uh, 13th century in particular, um, it was the tension between Corsica, uh, and, between, sorry, Genoa and Pisa, uh, which characterizes area. So um, in, especially uh, in Corsica, in Sardinia, we've got the Pisan control here, and so the area in blue looked to another power, and this was Aragon in Spain, the crown of Aragon uh, in there. So this is a later group who come in here um, are the Aragonese, uh, and eventually it becomes a Spanish colony, and that's precisely be, um, to counter the influence of the Pisans uh, at this um, particular time. Okay. Um, the Pope also intervenes, and this is yet another layer of complication uh, here. I mentioned that the Pisans have a commercial interest in subduing North Africans. <laughs> it's to do with commercial rivalry as much as it's to do with any sense of crusade. The two get very uh, mixed together. The Pope, and in the, from the 11th century onwards, the church has become increasingly um, aggressive in its claim uh, that it has the right to temporal government as well as spiritual government. And so the church itself becomes involved in a kind of crusade on the islands, remembering also that um, the islands had been under Byzantine control, and in 1053 you get the split between the Eastern and the Western churches. So that means that you know there's still this remnant of a schismatic government in there. So this uh, gives you know, the church 
some claim or some desire to get the islands uh, uh, aligned with the church. And this is done in two ways. One is by um, placing the diocese uh, under the control of the Archbishop of Pisa, largely in the name of the Pope. Uh, the second is to send out monks, okay, the two areas. So, so the diocese to control the cities, the monks to control the countryside. It's a, it's a two-pronged um, strategy in that way. Um, it's a disastrous policy in Corsica um, because of this tension that I'd mentioned earlier between the Pisans and the Genoese in the north and south. The Pope can't resolve it, so he gives three of the dioceses to Genoa and three of them to Pisa. If you think that's going to make the situation better, well, you're wrong. And, and, and that was wrong. He probably didn't have uh, much choice. Uh, maybe that's why he's called Innocent II. I'm not sure. Um, but it leaves a remarkable legacy on the islands, uh, and this is the point. And I'm sure if you've uh, put your hand up or arms up and pretended to hold the tower or whatever, you've been to Pisa and try and get this into a dinner party conversation tonight. Pisa developed a prestigious form of Romanesque architecture, incorporating brilliant white Car Carrara marble and superimposing oriental decorative motifs. You've seen the map of the Pisan world. They were impressed. They saw the Mamluk architecture in Egypt and in the Levant. Uh, they had access to that beautiful white marble. They create a form of the Romanesque, uh, which is spectacular, of course, and still enjoyed in places like Pisa and Pisa and Lucca um, to this day. What's remarkable then in this period is that you have it reproduced, materially not quite as rich, um, but architecturally just as distinctive in Sardinia and, um, and um, Corsica. So uh, just outside of Cagliari is a little uh, example. This is a church of Santa Maria outside. It's a pilgrimage church today, but it's outside uh, a farming village uh, of Uta on a flat plain uh, built in the 12th century. Very clearly, you can see in a style that imitates uh, the Pisan style. It wasn't built by the Pisans, however. <laughs> Um, it was built by the Victorines, who were a Marseille, <laughs> Marseillean um, um, monastic order. Okay, so this is one of these examples of the various monastic orders who were invited into the countryside. And it's one of the reasons why you get churches in this style so often in both Corsica and Sardinia in the countryside. Uh, out on the side, they're standing in the fields and this just simply adds um, um, to their beauty. Um, just some of the very clear sort of Pisan slash Oriental features. Something which comes from Arabic architecture is the understanding of the effect that strong light has on buildings. And the idea that through relief, through varied relief, such as you see on that um, image on the top right, you, the, the light does the sculpting for you. Okay, it's a very modern concept in art now, sculpting in light, but uh, this is exactly what's happening here in the architectural world. So those little subtle differences in relief and things like that play beautifully as the sun moves around uh, on the facade. Various things such as, you know, absolutely typical of this east and east west, these sort of an iconic uh, design versus the sort of more traditional um, French and northern Italian Romanesque uh, carving. Again, very, very oriental um, effect in that portal. Uh, and the contrasting stone, which has come uh, directly from medieval architecture uh, in the Levant. So scattered throughout uh, both of these islands, if you've just had enough of neuragic sites or some of the towns and things like that, or, and, and, and the medieval sites, um, um, these wonderful things. So perhaps one of the most uh, spectacular uh, examples uh, is uh, Santissima Trinita di Sarcaggia. Now this looks today to be up in the middle of nowhere, it was actually about, it's 10 kilometers from a town called Adara, which was the, um, in the Middle Ages, was the main town once people had moved away from the coast. So today it looks like it's in the middle of nowhere. It was actually just on the outskirts of a town, which is where you would expect um, a monastery. Uh, there's a wonderful, nobody knows what Sakarja means. I read a great legend about a woman called Sarkaja who brought her milk to the monks every morning and then there was a miracle, blah dee blah blah um, that's there. Um, so it's a great example. It's using basalt uh, and then a local form of white stone, not as brilliant as the Carrara marble. Uh, inside, very importantly, uh, it's got contemporaneous with the building from the 12th century, um, a great example of Tuscan Romanesque um, rare because in most places in Tuscany, of course, it gets redecorated in later styles uh, in the Quattrocento and beyond. So to find um, you know, uh, Romanesque um, painting uh, in this way is still, still fairly intact. 
um, is great. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, and the piece, this is, you know, the theatrical way we end the tour as well. We do this, this is up, right up in northern Corsica. Uh, this is called San Michele di Murato um, in an absolutely spectacular um, position on the hills uh, between two dioceses. Again, imagine the monks being sent there. I think there's a Vallombrosan monks uh, in this particular place being sent up to sort of pacify these territories to improve the land uh, and to ensure Orthodox Roman uh, Catholicism uh, is practiced there. It's enormously popular for weddings, so don't go there on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> um, that's beautiful there. Um, um, Cagliari itself, uh, though it's a hard city to get a handle on, but uh, the citadel, which you can see just up the top here, the gates, one of the monumental gates, and the walls, and indeed the cathedral, are also all from the Pisan period uh, as well. It's a, it's a mixed bag, Cagliari, very much in all senses uh, of the word. Uh, you can see the magnificent harbour there that attracted the Carthaginians and the Romans uh, and others and cruise ships today. Um, but uh, uh, that's also uh, largely Pisan. Just, uh, if you'll indulge me, just a couple of minutes, uh, uh, just a little bit on what uh, happened uh, next then. The medieval crown of Aragon, again, one of these elusive um, states that actually comprises the areas today we'd call Aragon, uh, in inland uh, Spain, Valencia, and most importantly, Catalonia, uh, were the compasses of it. Walking around the old city of Barcelona is probably the thing that most of you have done, is exactly from this period. Like so many of the other states, its wealth uh, is acquired through trade, and you can see there with the um, uh, um, with, the slow, with the hatched in areas there, uh, controlling a large part of the Western, Western Mediterranean, the, the Balearic Islands, Corsica, Sardinia, Sicily, and indeed the southern, uh, southern Italy, the, the kingdom of Naples uh, as it became. It's after the union of Castile and Aragon with Ferdinand and Isabella that southern Italy becomes uh, Spanish. Um, I'm going to do a, a little plug, Kathleen, who's sitting at the back, my colleague Kathleen Olive. Finally, we've nailed it after years. We've been waiting a boat that we work with finally next year is doing a cruise from Naples um, to Valencia. So we um, nailed that one and signed it up very, very quickly. So we've finally got a, a, been able to offer a tour that looks at the um, medieval crown of Aragon. But enough advertising. Let's, <laughs> um, let's move on. The, um, the um, Aragonese... Um, move in, uh, and as I said, they line themselves with the um, Arboreans, with the Judicato of Arborea. Um, eventually, it gets to the point uh, where, although the other states have, 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 have given over to um, uh, the, the Pisans and the Genoese, Arborea, which is ruled from the town of Oristano here, controls uh, the whole um, island, um, but eventually uh, they suffer a heavy loss in a battle at a place called San Luri, just to the north in 1409, just to the north of Cagliari. Uh, and at that point, the entire Judicato of Arborea, which is most of the island of Sardinia, is handed over to the Aragonese. Uh, and that's the point where um, Sardinia stops uh, being the master of its own destiny in that way, if it ever was to a huge extent, and starts to become a colonial power. And that's the point where historically, I'll leave um, Sardinia Corsica at about the same time in the same century, this is when the Genoese come in uh, and it becomes, and the island is literally sold uh, to the Bank of St. George, uh, who are ruling the island of Corsica um, for the Genoese uh, Republic. So what follows then in the next uh, 500 or so years uh, is that. I just want to leave you with one particularly attractive uh, figure, and this uh, is the Ju uh, uh, Jugissa, she is uh, in that um, Eleanor of Arborea. Almost every Sardinian town uh, has an Eleanor of Arborea street in it somewhere uh, that, that, that's there. She's uh, an important uh, figure. As I mentioned to you, the, uh, the Judicato of Arborea was the last one to hold out against uh, foreign forces. Uh, um, her father, <laughs> however, could see uh, what was coming and married her uh, to a Genoese uh, noble uh, nobleman. Well, husband died and son, who would have been the heir to the uh, judgeship, uh, was killed in an uprising and she finds herself as regent 
and a successful regent after her husband died, uh, but then as, as the uh, Judigessa uh, in charge uh, right uh, to the end. She is famous in Sardinia in particular because it's her code of laws, the Carta di Logu, which remain the law code of Sardinia right through to 1827. Um, um, through that's there. Um, she was educated, not surprisingly. This is her in the main square of, of, of um, Oristano. Uh, and rather like Frederick II of Hohenstaufen, the great uh, uh, German uh, medieval uh, ruler who wrote a book on falconry, uh, she also practiced falconry and uh, has a falcon named after her uh, in, 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 in that particular case. Um, again, she's rather hard to find except in statues and things like that. But if you travel to the medieval town of, Bo or to the town of Bosa, which has a lovely medieval um, castle at the top, originally the Malaspina family uh, from Pisa, but was later owned by Eleonora. Uh, and she has the so-called Palatine Chapel inside the castle um, frescoed uh, in this beautiful way. And I just wanted to show you, of course, uh, the falcon uh, there at the end. They're, they're three men, by the way. That's not Eleonora in a hairnet. Uh, they're, they're three men. So a complex, the postmodern world, um, a complex um, series of events, but a persisting identity, I think, uh, which is later in the 20th century distilled in films and other forms um, of uh, the Sardinian and also, I haven't really talked about it, but also uh, the Corsican um, identity. I think my next and final slide, oh, sorry, it slipped off the side. Um, now, this is to tempt you um, further. Uh, this is showing the beautiful town, uh, bastion town of Bonifacio uh, at the southern tip of Corsica. This was the first town to go over to Genoese. Remember, I said all the lords in the south because Pisa had moved in on the north, so all the south goes over to, to Genoa. The Genoese come down in 1295 and build this spectacular um, bastion. Uh, so that's there. So we still have periods of the Aragonese and the Spanish on Sardinia to consider, the Genoese on Corsica, the Savoys from Turin uh, on Corsica, and of course, all of the struggles for independence on both islands not to mention Napoleon. <laughs> so thank you very much, and I hope that's filled in a little bit further um, of the picture. Please.